This is Radio Bath. And welcome to Brave Business Conversation. We've got in the studio coming up Maxine Ward, a professional celebrant, and we're going to talk about celebration. This is the end of the year. Let's understand how celebrations shape our lives, how celebrations have evolved, especially in these really, really tough times that we've been celebrating. Let's get Maxine's perspective after this. Welcome back to Brave Business Conversation. What a appropriate song to start with. Let me introduce Maxine Ward, a professional celebrant. Hello, Maxine. Hello, Cynthia. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for asking me. Welcome, welcome. We're talking about celebration, the art of celebrations today. What has changed with celebrations after all these uncertainties that we face? (laughs) I think it's been very difficult for people to celebrate, hasn't it? So um, Hmm. with COVID, lots of people had to um, delay their weddings, for example, and that's been that has been really challenging because what that has meant is that there's quite a backlog um, and it's quite interesting that the, the law commission are currently reviewing the law around how people uh, can get legally married in the UK. Um, and although we're expecting we were expecting that to happen a bit sooner, COVID has delayed everything. Um, but what that's meant, I think, is that that there's a demand now for people to be able to celebrate more in the way that they would like to. Mm-hmm. So fewer people want religious ceremonies. Um, but it's uh, it's an interesting... Uh, I was reading uh, about people's um, reaction and using ritual as a response to anxiety. Interesting. And a, Yeah, so um, the, it says that anthropologists have uh, long realised that there is more ritual and more... Um, ceremony um, when times are really, really stressful. And I think a really good example of this is when we had the NHS clapping, for instance, Mm -hmm. because that's a ceremony and a ritual where people would turn up at the same time on the same day. um, What does what does rituals do uh, in terms of overcoming anxiety? How does rituals how do rituals help? Because it gives us a sense of certainty. So with ritual, um, it gives a sense of control, if you want, by yeah. imposing some kind of order. So traditional ceremonies, if you want, are always you, you know, done in the same way. A traditional Anglo-Saxon wedding, an Indian wedding, an Asian wedding, everybody knows what's happening and it's the coming together and the certainty. And I think that's um, it kind of provides us with a sense of control where we've been out of control. So the NHS clapping was, and it's, it provides us of the sense of coming together, a sense of belonging and a sense of being. Um, and so the question is, is how do we change modern day celebrations and modern day ceremonies to continue to achieve that? Because we never, uh, in, in, in olden times and, and prehistoric times, you've, we've, we've got pictures of um, paintings on caves etc which are forms of ritual and forms of celebration Um, and we used to have rituals to ask for good weather rituals to celebrate Mm -hmm. harvests um, and all sorts of different celtic rituals so and and we don't need them anymore we know what the weather's going to do we don't have to ask the gods for the weather so it has it has changed and um and so we i think as a modern society now we're looking at how we move forward and still get that sense of togetherness and celebration, uh, but not in the same way. How, how we modernise it, how we make it more real for us. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And how did you personally get involved in this and why have you chosen to become a celebrant? Um, I'm not sure whether people choose to become a celebrant. I think it, celebrancy chooses people, really. Um, and I think you have to have... Y- y- come to the right stage in life it's quite curious that most celebrants are middle-aged women I know (laughs) but there you are um my my story was uh, I had a background in in corporate I had some fantastic jobs for some really really good companies um I always found it personally challenging to manage people and I and I will admit sometimes I did it well and sometimes I did it quite poorly uh, and not in the right way. I think it's you and 90% of the population. Uh, probably. The so. yes. it's, it's, it's very difficult, <laughs> I think, um, managing people and uh, wanting to do that with integrity and wanting to do it in the right way. Yeah. Um, and so I started to coach and I'm still a life coach and I really, really enjoyed that. Um, and I did that over a number of years and also did neuro-linguistic programming, which is a fantastic tool. Um, And I came to a point in life where uh, I was about to be made redundant as a result of uh, COVID-19 and in a very fortunate situation where um, with my partner Hugo, we moved house um, and our circumstances made that that I didn't have to have a full time 
job. So we had a discussion and I started off coaching um, and coaching was great, but the market was very saturated. And I know as a person, I'm not, I wasn't as driven with all the competition. I found that really difficult because I'm a, I'm a responder rather than somebody who's driven to, to make new inroads. And my, um, my dad passed away during COVID and I read uh, at his funeral and I also helped organise his funeral because my sisters weren't able to do that um, just because of their emotional their emotional state and I'm, I'm the sort of stalwart in, in the family so I, I grabbed the bull by the horns and off I went. I met some amazing people in the funeral industry and um, had some some nice feedback on how I put my dad's funeral together and, and, and how I read. There was a celebrant there and it I didn't really think about it too much and I don't I can't tell you what it was but one day I said to Hugo oh I think the celebrant would be good and I sat and thought about it for a while um, and the reason I thought it was the right way for me is because just before I was due to get made redundant I went to my coach and said I'm about to get made redundant it's happened to me before and it's a very difficult conversation, not only for me, but for the person who's going to make you redundant. And um, the lady who was my boss was very upset at, at the time because it's it's not a nice thing to go through. So we discussed my work life and um, and I came up and I said, I always seem to get the difficult people. And him being a very experienced coach went, mm, that's really interesting. Why? Why was that? And we talked through it and it turned out, and this was, I guess, the epiphany for me, that I love to help people on their own terms. I like them to be successful on their terms with the things that they want um, rather than managing them to a corporate agenda. Yeah. And I think that's what I found really, really difficult, um, that I could talk to a person and look at them and think, you are really in the wrong job or... You're very, very stressed. So as an individual, I understand why you're not performing well um, and not let that influence the way that I manage people. Mm. So it was a combination of being, I think, responsive, practical. Um, I'm stoic. So being able to organise mm. people and actually wanting to make sure that that people are well looked after yeah. and I can help them do that. And that was what got me to the decision to become a celebrant. And I think your your amazing gift of empathy. Um, it's like I've never heard of someone being made redundant and says must be hard for them to deliver the news. You know, you've got oh. that empathy with the person across the table. And I can imagine that comes very useful when you're in a celebrant. You don't want sympathy. You don't want to get carried away in their emotion. You remain that professional um, partner to them. But at the same time, you empathize. And I know that from personal experience because, you know, we've known each other through the business women's community and uh, hosting Bath Business Network and everything. And you just you're just so interested in how people feel. Absolutely. Yeah. And and you know, everybody is different. So, um, you know, people ask me, they say, how, how can you how can you do funerals? I would be too upset. And I think the stoic in me says, they're not my family and I do empathise with them, but it is my job to make sure that they give the most appropriate send off to the person that they love or sometimes don't love in, mm -hmm. in, in the right way. Um, and not only that is that for me to take the helm to make sure that that happens um, because some people, so, uh, they're all different. Some people know exactly what they want um, in a ceremony and other people haven't a clue. No idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I want to talk more about um, the art of celebrating, especially I think it's very, very appropriate this end of the year with celebrating. Um, we'll be back with Maxine Ward after this. Made locally in Bath. This, this is Radio Bath. You're still listening to Brave Business Conversations, and we are still with Maxine Ward, a professional celebrant. We were talking a little bit about weddings marriages mm -hmm. and lots of them have been delayed and everything what's what are the latest trends in in weddings these days well i think now people are fewer people want a religious ceremony mm -hmm. um and more people want a ceremony that is more meaningful to them um so there there are two choices really for legal marriages in the uk at the moment one is to go to church and the other one is to go to the register office um 
both are constrained by the words that you have to say in order for it to be a legal ceremony. So as a celebrant, I can't legally marry people, and we are hoping, as a result of the review by the Law Commission, that that will change. So I now, um, as a celebrant, refer to the register office as the legal paperwork to, if you like, take the emotional connection away from that. Um, but that's always people's choices, and, and a lot of people want to do the legal bit and have that as their wedding anniversary and have a registrar uh, to go to a premises. And there is another restriction. So registrars are limited to premises that are licensed by the government. Mm. So that means you can't get married in your legally, if you like, in your back garden if mm. it's not lease, uh, licensed. So currently there you have to give notice that you want to get married and you either do that at church by the reading of the bans or you give notice to the register office. Um, almost all weddings have to take place in a licensed premises and you're also constrained by the words that you say. So um, I had a couple, actually the very first wedding that I did, where a couple wanted to replicate their register office wedding. Right. And I said, you've got so much more choice, you're legally married. Um, and they, you have a tick list, literally, you pick from four, four vows, what do you want to say? So they are vows that everybody makes to mm. each other um and can not, you make your own vow uh no not at legal marriage you have to, oh, you have right, to pick right. but With you could probably add a poem or yeah, add you, a can, you can you can it's add, very yeah. short it's very short or perhaps one 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 reading um and then pick off the words that you say when you exchange the rings so it's very 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 impersonal mm. and i think m now more people are starting to look for something that is really meaningful and unique to them yeah. which is why uh, people now are choosing to have a celebrant, and I have lots of int interesting questions about the about the cost of that. So, if, but what you can do at a register office is something called a two plus two, and that is really your legal paperwork with a witness. And then, as a celebrant, uh, the services that I give are entirely bespoke. So you can have the vows that you want. You can have the family members involved that you want. Um, to do you can say what you want you can exchange rings you can exchange something else if you want a mixture of religion and non-religion you can have that if you have a humanist celebrant mm. then there is no religion whatsoever yeah so it really gives couples the choice of whatever they want i was i was talking to uh, a couple a couple of days ago who are going to have uh, their dog as part of the ceremony is going to yeah. walk up the aisle with a little box around its neck <laughs> that it has that has the, the ring in it in. yeah yeah um and i like to think of it um as when you have your wedding anniversary and you open your photographs and you look at them what a beautiful gift it is to be able to remember all of the words that you said to each other and how and and how meaningful and personal and bespoke that they mm. are going to be and so i think there's an increased call for that um having a celebrant will work out much the same as having um, a registrar come to a licensed premises. And the brilliant thing about it is that it gives you the choice of your venue. So you can get yeah, married. Yeah, you can get your, married in your backyard. In if your you'd like. backyard, on a beach, underwater, if you have a celebrant <laughs> who can. And I always say to people, as long as it's not illegal and it's not immoral, um, then I will do I'm it. And I'm too old, <laughs> too old to do naked. So, you know, um, that's not going to happen. But I think it's about the freedom of choice. The other thing is the things that people um, celebrate are differing. So, so, so marriage is, is an obvious one. Celebration of life um, at a funeral. They are changing now. People are, you know, they're, they're less maudlin, they're less mournful. People um, want to celebrate the life and recognise the life of a loved one. People are choosing now not to wear black, yes. for instance. I, I always ask the question. Um, and they and I always encourage people uh, at the end of a funeral, and it's very difficult at a crematorium, for instance, that it's a 30-minute slot, to end with something joyful because it is uh, a celebration of, of life. And many of um, the services that I do are exactly that. So... Our, our view of of how we uh, celebrate and remember a person, I think, has changed. Yes. Um, but people can still have hymns. 
um, all things bright and beautiful. I'd like to say if every well, song I guess you can have a sing a pop song, song if you'd like. You. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. I had um, the last funeral I had. We had Abba as we left. Oh, nice! I've had uh, um, somebody who was really into their eighties music, so every piece of music um, was from the eighties. And I also had a family who's um, who lost their father, and he was a very very big classical music fan and they'd chosen all the music and I thought oh that's great that's a lot of the hard work done but they actually wanted particular movements from particular pieces of music oh wow so it was a very fine art and luckily we have technology in crematoria now which means that you can you can do that so all of that has changed but then there are different um types of ceremony that we didn't used to have so people may choose to have a citizenship yeah, a celebration of citizenship true. or transition yeah you know. I think it's also interesting that I think because you, you may not be able to control what's happened uh, to you during all this uh, period of uncertainty your, your wedding's delayed or somebody died or something like that but you can control how you choose to celebrate it or to um, remember it I do also notice that at least back in my country, um, funerals are getting shorter. There's no five-day wakes and everything. It's just instant. They pass away and immediately you just put them on the ground like that day or the next day. It's very, very short. Um, And it's almost like um, the sorrow behind it. Yes, there's a lot of sorrow, but now it's almost people choosing to celebrate the life rather than um, you know, the, the tragedy or the death and everything. And, and, and it's just interesting how that, that must help in people's psyche and the way they recover out of it, you know? Yeah, I, I, th- I think so. And I think it's, it differs um, when, when you're celebrating somebody's life. So you know, if, if somebody has had a long and fruitful life and it's been well-lived, um, then really they're, they're the, the easier funerals to yes. do. And it's not that they're um, any more or any uh, less missed or any more or any less loved by their family. Um, but that's an easier celebration of life. There are, of course, always the more challenging. Yeah, um, the young person. The young person or, or yeah. where somebody has, has chosen to end their own life are difficult. But even in that, there are still moments of celebration um, in recognition of of recognition of the life but um it, it it's really interesting it starts to make you think about um how what would i have yeah yeah um and some people choose uh, especially if they're terminally ill to uh, have a celebration of their life while they're still there mm-hmm. that's that's a, an increasing uh, sort of thing that's on the up and a lot of people will now choose to write um, their own eulogies, their own eulogies, mm. or their own funerals when they know they're, you know, they're 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 about to go. So, the very last funeral that I did was a lady, um, who uh, en- ended in a, in a hospice, but she had chosen exactly what she wanted. So it mm-hmm. made my role as a celebrant um, a lot easier. Um, but talking of eulogies, that's really interesting because some some people want to write and read them and others don't. So there's an art there, um, which my coaching has helped to be able to tell a story on their behalf. Mm, I want you to stop right there because in the next segment, I do want you to combine a bit of that life coaching skill that you I know you have just to talk a little bit about about telling stories about people's life and the mindset we all need to get into to be able to celebrate even when times are quite painful. Yep, right? We'll be back with Maxine Ward after this. Made locally in Bath. This is Radio Bath. Back on Brave Business Conversations, I'm your host, Cynthia, and we are here with Maxine Ward, a professional celebrant. We've just been talking about weddings and then we kind of segued into funerals. We did. <laughs> Talk about there a beginning and an end. I'm not quite sure how that happened. Circle That's of all right. Life. Circle of life, Cynthia. <laughs> um, uh, we, we kind of ended, or I asked you to end on, uh, just because I find that it's a completely different topic about uh, what's going on in our hearts and our brains that help us to celebrate well or prevent us from celebrating. You know, and I know that you've got loads of skills in life coaching as well and a, a huge heart for it. So, how, how do you find people who th- find it challenging to celebrate versus people who find it quite easy to celebrate no matter how difficult things get? What do you think is the difference? 
that's a big, big question. Um, I yeah, think you got five minutes. Go. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, there is so much going on. Um, some of it can be around upbringing mm-hmm. and the influence and nurture and and nature, and and how we were raised. So some people are are raised with a really uh, positive outlook on life, seeing the good in everything, celebrating, being open and having fun. Um, and other people aren't quite, you know, they're not they're not raised in the same way. So they, they, they don't do it as naturally and they find that really difficult. Um, some of it might be governed by guilt. How can I... How, how can I celebrate can when I things celebrate are so tough? When this, yeah, when things are so tough or... Um, or other people are not having such a such a great time. Um, you know, there's a lot of stress uh, and anxiety, and that has been exacerbated uh, by COVID. Um, there is probably sometimes a need to conform mm-hmm. and fit in, mm-hmm. uh, which a lot. Of yeah, if you're have. sad, I need to be sad as well. Yeah, yeah. and I need, I need to feel your sadness. So I think there are there are so many factors. Um, and there's also, I think, a, an interesting slant where there's a lot of slogans and sayings about being positive. Yeah. And I think it's a good it's a good thing to, uh, to to promote looking on the bright side of life. But also, there's this. I, I heard a very interesting. I don't remember who it was by now. Um, uh, reading on Radio Four by a lady who said actually. I find it quite intimidating and almost bullying. I've been so ill and people are telling me that, you know, they're looking down on me because I'm not always positive about life. I'm not reading all the slogans yeah. about being positive. Um, so I think there are lots of people um, who are pulled, you know, backwards and forwards. Um, and and it's, uh, because ceremony has changed, in a way people don't actually know what they can have and they can do, and they can celebrate. So um, I think there are, there are there are a lot of a lot of and factors. I think, you know, you think celebration. You, we started out with that music from Cool and the Gang, celebrate, and you feel like you need to go into your party dress and go woo hoo. Oh, you don't have to though. But celebration. What I love about when we were preparing for the show and you're bouncing back emails back and forth, it wasn't just about celebrate, having a great time, staying positive is all smiles. It could be just a heart felt optimism or a heartfelt choice to accept Mm -hmm. uh, what is happening um, instead of allowing you allowing yourself to you know or only choosing to focus on what's sad and you said something in the email also about remembering commemorating so celebration is not always get your party hat on and we forget and you live you live in this delusional world that everything is positive but Sometimes celebrating grief, the mm-hmm. ability of to pe- for people to just take time out and grieve, um, is also going to be quite a healing process. Instead of try to forget everything and be and smile, you know that's the denial. Mm-hmm. You know, denying yourself of grief could actually, uh, you know, not be a good thing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And and you know there are there are several stages of 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 grief and and. I can't remember them all off by heart. But I think it's really important to recognise that, uh, you know, w- when somebody does pa- pass away, that grief is part of the process. Mm-hmm. Um, and even at a uh, commemoration or a celebration of life, so I, I, I did one in the summer for um, a guy who'd passed away same age as me, 55, really quickly, um, and his daughters who were absolutely stoic wonderful in their early 20s um it was two hours because so many people wanted to get up and talk about him and what he did um his girls were really proud of him he'd raised his girls he they were best friends it was absolutely it was a beautiful beautiful thing to be at there is still a time for grief um and part of being a celebrant at at that point is to almost give people permission to grieve Mm -hmm. so every service that I do albeit subtly um you know you don't stand up and say it's all right if you want to cry but (laughs) more or less you say you know that that tears um are not a a sign of weakness they are a sign of love Mm -hmm. um so 
in any ceremony we have what we we call a cer ceremonial curve okay um because there is a high point or a low point at which the emotion is heightened so for example uh uh, at a funeral, it'd be at the time of committal mm -hmm. when you say your final goodbye. At a wedding, it will be uh, when they exchange vows and exchange rings. So that's when everybody will get their handkerchiefs Aww. out. So a good and well-structured ceremony, if you want, will follow a curve at which you know when that heightened emotion is going to come. And then hopefully you go out feeling good. And there's no reason why you can't, you can't do that at, at a funeral. When you uh, at a wedding, it's when you present the couple um, to the uh, to the to the other partner to the guest yeah. to the, the other partner oh. and 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 to the wedding guests. So there has to be that, but celebration doesn't have to be a big party or an official um, a celebration. So when I when I'm life coaching, it's really interesting to see how little people who come for coaching actually look and celebrate the small wins. Mm -hmm. and the small achievements um, and they they fail because they're always going for the big things and not taking the small things so one of the questions that I will always ask when they come back from their for their second is session is what's different for you mm -hmm. what is different for you to get them to realize although their long-term goal might be months away even within a space of seven days something significant has happened and to be able to recognize and celebrate that by talking to it and giving them that sense of achievement so celebration can be can be done in lots of different ways it doesn't have to be a big yeah have to be a big ceremony it's interesting instead of asking how have you what have you achieved since last session or last quarter i also like to ask how have you grown mm -hmm. you know and i think growing being what's different it's it's more of neutral and it's more of a process rather than People think achievement is like, oh, I've got to win a gold medal somewhere or I've got to double something or something. It, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, yeah, even the, the, the accomplishment of being able to accept what you cannot control is in a way growth and seeing things in a different way, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, no, I think it's fantastic. And finding that sense of, um, let's call it achievement, but not necessarily achievement, when you're writing eulogies is very very interesting because not everybody has gone out and had an amazing career mm -hmm. um not everybody has gone out and done something that has changed the world um, and it's actually being able to help the family articulate who that person was and what they did so um my very very first funeral that i ever did which was very nerve-wracking your first i had to do the whole funeral from beginning to end mm. and so i had to write the eulogy and this was for a lady who was a very stoic no-nonsense country woman who didn't really throw her arms around her children a lot and um tell them that she loved them but she loved them because she did for them so this lady was mucking out her daughter's horses the night before she died she fed you know she fed everybody she made sure that everything was there for them and it was being able to ask the right questions to be able to tell that story because inside the family knew but how do you articulate what mm -hmm. that person meant um because many many services are a sense of they did this, they did this job and they did that job. Yeah. And it's the same. It's not a CV. It's not a CV. <laughs> and it's the same um, when people marry. How mm -hmm. how do you question them to enable them to be able to articulate what they mean to each other exactly. and what marriage means? Exactly. So. And I like that what you said, you know, the celebration curve. You know, when we are allowed to have that high moment and that low moment, we come out of that ceremony feeling relieved that mm. we've expressed ourselves. You know, we've expressed how, how much we love that person, how much we're sad to see them go. Or, you know, even in weddings, you see people cry because you're letting your child go to somebody else, for instance. But after that, you 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 just pat your cheeks with a handkerchief or whatever, and you feel, huh, you feel that sense of satisfaction that that was a great ceremony, you know, and I think that, that permission. I mean, for me, the best funeral, and this was from Andy Warhol, inspired by Andrew Warhol, uh, when I watched the movie Man on the Moon. I don't exactly know how it actually 
was uh, in real life, but when he had that little karaoke screen with follow the bouncing ball and everybody was singing along and that was, you know, celebration of his life uh, was a video of him at his best, at his best. And, um, and what a wonderful wedding, uh, what a wonderful funeral. And uh, I, I don't know how I got to this website, but I also found a website of creative coffins. Mm. So if you're a hunter, you can have a coffin made out to look like a rifle or a bullet. Or if you're a dog lover or something, you can have a coffin made out to look like a sleeping dog or something. You know, it's amazing how these craftsmen, they just craft out coffins and they're all custom made. Well, I'm sure there's certain templates. If you're a traveler, it could be a suitcase. Absolutely. Yeah. It's fascinating, <laughs> isn't it? And, yeah. it, and it, it is, um, I have found you, people can still worry about what is appropriate and there isn't really any. And this is, I think, back well, to your What's very, appropriate to you? Exactly. Right. Back to one of the original questions that you asked is how things have changed. And they're not a set pattern. Um, you can have whatever you like. I mean, I had um, a lady who was a big tennis fan. Mm -hmm. Her committal cu uh, music was a theme tune from Wimbledon. <laughs> exactly. It was, it, was, it was super, you know. So being able to... Um, have something that resonates yeah and and recognition of who that person really really was or i mean if you've got a transition ceremony who you were and who you are going to be who are you going to become for a baby naming it's all around how um the love that is in the room and the care and the commitment about, um of the people around the newborn um and it's just you know let's let's have what we want let's have what is meaningful to us because we're not all the same um so why 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 stick to the same script fantastic well it's been lovely having you on the show maxine and um how do people get in touch with you oh, well i'm um, maxine ward celebrant on google um i am on uh, instagram uh, which is at mw celebrant but if you google maxine ward celebrant you can find my details there Absolutely. And it's always a pleasure to talk to Maxine. She's very emphatic and she knows her stuff. So thank you for being on the show. Absolute pleasure, Cynthia. Thank you for asking me.